Moving back to our discussion of fishy problems, we should now talk about seguitoxin. Seguitoxin is caused by consuming reef fish, such as barracuda, snapper, and moray eel. Seguitoxin also acts on sodium channels, but this time the toxin opens these channels, causing a depolarization of the nerve. So let's think back. Do you remember what the mechanism of action of tetrodotoxin was? Tetrodotoxin prevented depolarization of these sodium channels, while seguitoxin actually opens these channels, causing a depolarization. So seguitoxin has symptoms similar to cholinergic poisoning, but one symptom will stand out. Do you have any idea what the differentiating symptom is? Seguitoxin poisoning is going to present with temperature-related dysesthesia. Well, what's that? Temperature-related dysesthesia is the sensation of touching a hot item and feeling a cold temperature, or touching a cold item and feeling hot. If you see this on test day, remember, reef fish and ciguatoxin. Also, the treatment for this is just supportive. We now have our third fish disease, scombroid poisoning, which is going to be caused by the dark-meated fish. So let's go back to intro to biology. The taxonomy tree lists the species, genus, family, order, etc. We're going to focus primarily on the fish from the family Scombridae. Now these fish include the tuna, the bonito, mackerel, and mahi-mahi. When these fish are improperly stored, this can lead to scombroid poisoning. It may be helpful to understand the mechanism of scombroid poisoning, since this can give clues to the presenting symptoms. If these dark-meated fish are improperly stored, then bacteria can grow. Some of that bacteria may produce the enzyme histidine decarboxylase, which is going to convert our amino acid histidine into histamine. Thinking back to biochemistry, do you remember what vitamin is required as a cofactor for the conversion of histidine into histamine? So you saw this figure earlier from the biochemistry metabolism section. The cofactor required for this reaction is going to be vitamin B6. So now that we have made a bunch of histamine due to this improperly stored fish, we're going to cook the fish using regular cooking techniques. However, histamine is fairly resilient to heat and it's not going to degrade with normal cooking. So if somebody is to eat this histamine-laden fish, they'll develop symptoms like flushing of the face, a perioral burning sensation, urticaria, pruritus, or even an anaphylaxis-like symptom. Can you think of any drugs we have in our pharmacy toolbox that we can use to treat a histamine overdose? Well, we could use antihistamines. Don't think too hard there. Do you know an example of an antihistamine? Or, put another way, a histamine antagonist? Well, there are lots, but diphenhydramine or loratadine would be a good example. Do you remember the difference between H1 receptors and H2 receptors. H1 receptors will increase nasal and bronchial secretions, increase vascular permeability leading to flushing of the face, contraction of the bronchioles leading to wheezing, and pruritus and pain. H2 receptors, on the other hand, are primarily associated with an increase in gastric acid secretion. And then finally, to bring home this point that receptors are super important, do you remember what the G protein class the H1 and the H2 receptor is. Are they GS, GI, or GQ? Yeah, that's right. H1 is going to be of the GQ class, and H2 receptors are of the GS class. So back to our histamine overload with scombroid poisoning. If the symptoms get really bad, treatment can include the antihistamines along with bronchodilators or epinephrine. So now would be a good time to go back and review the function of the alpha and the beta adrenergic receptors that we covered previously in our G-protein-linked second messenger discussion. Hopefully you guys are experts on the alpha and the beta receptors by now. So I've got a question. What class of G-proteins are alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors linked? I'm looking for four answers here. I'll give you a second to think about this and write down any answer you may have. Think you know it? If you need more time, go ahead and pause right now. Otherwise, I'm going to click to show the answer. Did you use the mnemonic 
kiss and kick till you're sick of super kinky sex? So the answer is going to be alpha 1s are GQ, alpha 2s are GI, and both beta 1 and beta 2 are both GS. So using our mnemonic, Q-I-S-S, -S, kiss, the Q is going to represent alpha 1, I is be alpha 2, beta 1, and beta 2. So this is just a really quick way to categorize different receptors for test day. Let's now move on to the sympathomimetics. All sympathomimetics stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, although they're not all going to stimulate the same receptors. So the key to knowing this section is finding out which drugs stimulate which receptors. Now just like the cholinomimetics, which we talked about earlier, there are going to be two general classes of our sympathomimetics. On one hand, we have our direct-acting sympathomimetics. Then on the other hand, we have our indirect agents. So let's go ahead and start with our direct agents. So how do the direct sympathomimetics work? Well, these agents exert an effect directly on the sympathetic receptors, just like the alpha and the beta receptors. However, not all of the receptors are going to be activated at the same time. So let's start off with a few drugs. Albuterol and salmeterol are agonists that are more selective for beta-2 than beta-1. Remember that beta-2 is going to bronchodilate, making the airway more open. Albuterol and salmeterol are therefore going to be used for the treatment of asthma. So what's the difference between these two? Well, albuterol has a shorter half-life it's going to be used for more acute asthma attacks, while salmeterol is going to be used for more long-term treatment. Dobutamine primarily stimulates our beta-1 receptors and is therefore going to be inotropic. Dobutamine can be used in the treatment of heart failure or for cardiac stress testing. So what receptors do our dopamine drugs work on? Dopamine primarily stimulates the D1 receptor and D2 receptor equally at lower doses. At medium doses, it's going to affect our beta receptors. And then at large doses, we'll see it acting upon our alpha receptors. So making it both inotropic and chronotropic. Now, dopamine can be used in the treatment of shock and also heart failure. So it's especially useful in the treatment of shock because it raises the blood pressure without reducing our renal vasculature flow. Remember that D1 receptors are going to relax our renal vascular smooth muscle, which is going to preserve our perfusion to the kidney, and that's very important in the case of shock. At high doses, epinephrine is going to stimulate alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. However, it's relatively more selective for beta receptors at low doses, and then more so for alpha at higher doses. So how is epinephrine used? Well, it is used clinically to treat anaphylaxis, open angle glaucoma, asthma, and then hypotension. Isoproteranol is an isolated beta agonist. That's an easy way to remember it isolated beta agonist is isoproteranol. Now it stimulates both the beta 1 and beta 2 receptors equally. So just think, iso means equal, so it's an easy way to remember beta 1 and beta 2 equally. Now it can be used in the evaluation of tachyarrhythmias, but it's rarely used clinically because it can worsen ischemia. Norepinephrine primarily stimulates the alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors, and it also stimulates beta-1 receptors, just to a lesser extent. Now, it does not stimulate beta-2 receptors. So, you better use epinephrine if you're going to look for more of the beta-2 effects. It can be used for hypotension, low blood pressure, but it can significantly decrease our renal perfusion, especially when given in conjunction with NSAIDs. So why is that? Why can it decrease the renal perfusion in the presence of an NSAID? Well, it's because there is increased renin release stimulated by beta-1 receptor activation and vasoconstriction induced by alpha-1 activation. So stimulating the beta-1 will cause increased renin release 
and vasoconstriction with alpha-1 agonism. So we don't really see any vasodilatory effect. Vasodilation occurs with beta-2 stimulation. Well, I just told you norepinephrine really just doesn't act upon beta-2 receptors. So make sure you're going to protect the kidney perfusion when using norepinephrine. Phenylephrine primarily stimulates alpha-1 and also has a lesser effect on alpha-2 receptors. Now, it can be used to dilate the pupil without producing cycloplegia because there is no effect on the sympathetic innervation for accommodation. Accommodation does not have sympathetic uh, innervation. It's also going to be vasoconstricting, phenylephrine vasoconstricts, making it a useful drug to treat nasal congestion. Now, the direct sympathomimetics are going to be an important topic and can show up on test day. It'd be beneficial to sit down and learn what receptors each one of these drugs plays upon. So we just covered the direct sympathomimetics. Remember, those are the agents that are going to actually directly bind to that target receptor and cause some sort of effect. Now let's shift gears and cover the indirect sympathomimetics. So how do these indirect sympathomimetics work? Well, these agents are going to act by either increasing the release of stored catecholamines, as you can see here, or they're going to prevent the reuptake of these catecholamines within the cleft. They do not actually stimulate the receptor. The drug itself doesn't stimulate the receptor, so that's why they're called indirect. So let's go ahead and start off with our first drug. Amphetamines release stored catecholamines and prevent the reuptake and it's also going to be used clinically to treat ADHD, narcolepsy, and obesity. So as you can see here in the figure, we have stores of catecholamines, and these are going to be released from the uh, nerve terminal, causing increased catecholamine levels. Ephedrine is also going to release stored catecholamines, and it's used to treat uh, nasal congestion, urinary incontinence, and also low blood pressure, or hypotension. Similarly to amphetamine, these stores of catecholamines are going to be released. So let's show that again. We're just releasing these extra stores of catecholamines. Our third drug is cocaine. Cocaine prevents the catecholamine reuptake, which will cause vasoconstriction. So here we have this catecholamine in the cleft, and we're going to prevent the reuptake through the use of cocaine. So here, the catecholamines are in the synaptic cleft. They're not reuptaken. And this is actually going to cause an increased availability of the catecholamines to bind to receptors. Now, cocaine can lead to vasospasm, which increases the risk for a myocardial infarction and stroke. And it's somewhat unique in that it's also used as a local anesthetic. In the case of a cocaine overdose, why would you not want to give a beta blocker? Well, Beta blockers are contraindicated if you take a large dose of cocaine, since if you block these beta receptors, you'll have unopposed alpha activation. Now, unopposed alpha activation can cause extreme hypertension, and then thus place undue stress on the heart, causing either angina, uh, myocardial infarction, or even lead to a stroke. Let's do a quick question to show how the sympathomimetic agents could appear on the USMLE. Why would dopamine be used to treat a hospitalized patient with a low blood pressure of 80 over 40 and no urine production over the past 24 hours? Well, this is going to be because dopamine increases blood pressure while at the same time maintains renal perfusion. Norepinephrine would also increase blood pressure, but it's going to actually decrease renal perfusion because it's not going to affect those dopamine receptors. So that's why norepinephrine should not be used. So my next question to you is, what receptors does dopamine work on? Do you remember? Dopamine is going to work on D1 receptors, the same as it works on D2 receptors. That's going to affect beta receptors and also alpha receptors at high doses. So alpha beta, and dopamine receptors, depending on what the dosage of the dopamine levels were. So remember, it's going to affect dopamine receptors at lower doses, beta receptors at, at medium doses, and then at very large doses, we're going to see some alpha activation as well. 
So you would not use norepinephrine in this patient because it would not affect these dopamine receptors. So you won't get that renal perfusion. They're not making urine in the past 24 hours. So we'd want to give dopamine to treat their low blood pressure and at the same time, hopefully increase some renal perfusion.